He's speaking to us. He's moving in this place. What is it that you need to surrender this morning? Maybe something you've been holding on to for a while. Maybe something from just this morning. That you know right now in this moment, you need to give it to him, surrender it. name Jesus we pray and everybody said amen amen it is so good to worship together so good well why don't you greet a few people around you say good morning and then you can take a seat Hi everyone, I'm Mandy and I'm the Next Steps Pastor here at Harbour Point and I'm glad you've chosen to spend part of your weekend with us. If this is your first time joining us, welcome! And you should know we are a group of imperfect people who don't have all the answers and all have a next step in knowing God more deeply. So wherever you are in your spiritual journey, curious about who God is or already convinced, know that you are welcome here. At Harbour Point, we believe that giving is an extension of our worship, a response to everything God has provided in our lives and a way to respond in gratitude and surrender to God's will and work for our lives. Each week we take time during the service to bring an offering, not because it's a tradition or a requirement, but because we know God specifically uses sacrifice and giving to shape and mould us more like Him, a more generous people. Proverbs 11 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. We believe God calls us to give because of what it does to our heart. God can do incredible things, even with the most limited resources. So it has never been about the amount, but rather a journey to become more and more generous people. So today, we have a number of ways that you can respond by giving, but be encouraged. 
God is doing a good work in all of us, and he is able to do far greater things with our resources than we can even imagine. We are so excited for our annual Trunk or Treat event on Saturday, October 29th. It's an opportunity to give our kids a fun way to collect candy and show off their costumes. The event is the highlight of the fall season with costume competitions, hot apple cider and a chilli cook-off. You do not want to miss it. We also want to invite you to be part of this event by signing up to serve. Whether it's decorating your car, handing out or donating candy, or entering your chilli for the cook-off. We hope that you will join in the fun and make this a fantastic night for our kids. Some of our deepest needs as women are for belonging and community. There is beauty in all seasons of life represented in our Harbour Point community and we want to celebrate that as we gather together. Join us for a night of connection on November 4th. We will hear from Amanda McGuire on how to be a woman who prioritises healing and will spend time with other Harbour Point women in all life stages. It's going to be a great evening and we would love for you to join us. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. Follow us at harbourpoint.church or on our app to stay connected throughout the week. It's great to be with you as we begin our new series, Getting Control of the Second Emotion. All right, hey everybody, how's it going? Nice to see you guys, glad you made it. Uh, I saw, you know, this tends to be a lot of folks who's, uh, who've got little kids in their house and they're like, we're up at 5.30 and we tried to go to, we went to bed at 2.30, we're up at 5.30, we're up now and that's just kind of, we're just here, we're ready to go. And so those of you guys who made it with little kids, welcome, that's a total heroic effort. For those of you guys who uh, maybe you were bribed or tricked or someone, you know, made, they just kind of told you, look, you gotta try to, I'll buy you breakfast, but you gotta go with me to this place. I'm grateful that you made it and I hope that you find at least uh, however it is that you got here, as we say a lot around here, my hope is that you find this is a place where people who we, we are convinced that our lives were made to be oriented around Jesus. We know that that's really, really tough to do. And this is full of this room full of people or however you might be joining us, whether you're in the tent or at home. It's a group of people who need each other to make that a reality to go, look, God made us to make, you know, we need us. We need us. God made us for the purpose of following him. And uh, it's hard to be a follower of Jesus, but it is so worth everything we were intended for. And so our hope is that you get a chance to take your next step, whatever that looks like. You'll find we don't have everything figured out. Um, you'll find out we're a pretty human group of people. And um, so for all the, the goodness and whatever else that might be, there's also some, some struggle with that. Our hope is that you find yourself, this might be, that this might be a place you could call home. A lot to talk about today. Really excited about it. <clears throat> um, also, by the way, I don't want to brag, but we're already, my, Amanda and I are already planning for our trunk or treat thing that we're doing next week. We have, we have a total plan. It's going to be awesome. I don't know. We're going to decorate a car and hand out candy, which, but it, nevertheless, you want to come join us, it's going to be incredible. Okay, that said, a lot to cover. We don't have a lot of time, and I'm really, really excited about it. Based on the response last night, too, by the way, it turns out I'm not the only person who's dealing with the issue we're going to talk about today. It turns out a lot of people are, um, and it is, um, it ended up being kind of a connecting you know, kind of, I think, talk for a lot of people. So let's get right to it. First, uh, again, I'm not sure the 11 o'clock service can handle this. I'm going to ask you guys, and you're going to have to give me some feedback. 11 o'clock, they're going to look at me like, look, we barely made it. We, we slept in through most stuff. We're already on sort of a pancake, you know, low blood sugar, like blood sugar kind of coma right now. And so I get, you guys are sharp. I don't know if they can handle it. Five got there. I, I'm, I, I have, my hopes are high, but I'm going to need some feedback from you, all right? So fill in this blank. When I'm at my best... Okay, when I'm at mass, when you're thinking of yourself like, I'm doing great, things are great, things are lining up, I'm on fire, everything's wonderful, however, whatever it is you might be, when you are at your best, whatever that looks like, I'm blank. What kind of person are you when you're at your best? Go ahead, what do you got? Yeah. What? Yeah. Just intent or a 10? Like, I'm a 10, I'm a 10 in every cut, check me out. <laughs> you guys see that? I'm a 10, look at that, I've been working out. Eating right, staying away from the carbs, a little bit of donuts on Sunday, but other than that, yeah, no, yeah, sure, 10. I know it's not what you said, I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay, what else? Happy. happy, sure, you're happy. Things are going great. I'm happy, smiles on my face, I'm at my best. What else? Content. Content, is that what you said, content? Yeah, that was a way better answer than yours. Yeah, yeah, way better. <laughs> what else? <laughs> Patient and kind. Yeah, these are all the kinds of things we are. We're calm. Things were, other people were being rattled and we're like, it's not a big deal. Why is, everything, why is everybody freaking out? I'm fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Calm, patient, kind. We're generous. You know, you need something. Yeah, I got something. I got this. Don't worry about it. I got this. And it's like we're all of those kinds of things. And all the circumstances that go around when we're at our best, these aren't the causes, but circumstances, they're like we're well rested. It's like we got enough sleep. 
were well fed. The Lakers finally got a win. May never happen this season. That's okay. But nevertheless, one th- now there's one thing. Now, of all the things, when we're at our best, we're amazing. People like us. This is why the people that we're dating are like into us. They met us at our best. We managed to stuff down all the stuff that's not so great so they don't see that for a while. When you're married, it's like, wow, okay, we're seeing a lot of things here. This is fun. Uh, but never, you know, however you look at it, one thing, I mean, probably more than anything else, threatens to get the best of us. One thing tends to take away or get the best of us. And all of us have some familiarity with it. All of us have some experience of it on either side of it. And it's this. Anger. Anger. Anger gets the best of us. How many of you could say, just by a show of hands, you have a moment in your life where you could say, yeah, anger got the best of me. Just show hands. Show hands. Yeah, most everybody. Some of you, you've never had this experience. You might be Jesus. I don't know. I, I, you, you might be sitting in the midst of some of these people. But anger gets the best of us. We're well acquainted with it. And whether you're a person who it's always obvious when you're angry, like everybody knows, it's like they're, they're set off. We can tell right away. You, don't, you make no attempt to hide it. Everybody knows you're angry. Whether you're that kind of person where you're kind of the always explosive kind of outward kind of anger person. Or if you're a person who is angry but stuffs it all in, buries it, you're going to hold that volcanic magma for later, you're going to stuff that down. Now either way, whether you're a dormant volcano or you're an active volcano kind of person, all of us are well acquainted with anger. And what's surprising about anger is its ability to undo what we intended to do. We intended to be a particular way, and often anger has the ability to undo what we intended to be and who we intended. Maybe even more surprising is how susceptible we are. Even for people who are like, I'm not an angry person, the truth is we're all susceptible to some measure of anger because so much of our regret or our sorrow or our pain or the damage that we've seen or the damage that we've caused or whatever, however it might be connected, somehow is connected to the idea of anger. And we know our anger can get away from us from time to time. We know that anger has a cost. And we've seen it. We've seen anger directed at us, and we've known the cost personally. We've seen anger from us towards other people, and we've seen the cost of that kind of anger shrapnel that hit some people around us, and it was, maybe we were surprised. Our loved ones have felt it from us, and from other people. The Bible says it this way, that anger gets the best of us all the time, and sometimes it says this, fools give full vent to their rage, but the But the wise bring calm in the end. In other words, there's something about us that gets a little bit stupid when we let anger get the best of us. But anger isn't the first thing we feel when something happens. Anger is not the first thing we feel. Anger is a response to something else. In other words, anger does have a cost, but anger, because we're responding to something else, anger also has a cause. Anger has a cost, but it also has a cause. Now think back to a moment when anger got the best of you. And there's a few of you who've never had the anger get the best of you, but that's all right. The conditions may have been ripe. You know, you were hungry or tired. The Lakers kept on losing. But whatever the the conditions, they're just setting the stage. They're not the cause of the reason for your anger. You and I, we get angry because something happened. We get angry because something happened. There's an unmet expectation. There's a broken promise. There's some kind of betrayal or disappointment. Perhaps there's a threat to us. That's the reason we get angry. Some of you are like, but wait, I, my uncle, he's an always angry. Every room he walks in, it's like, he's just angry. He's already set off. We don't know why. We don't know why, but he's always set. There's always anger happening with that guy. And the truth is, what I want to tell you, I don't use this word lightly, okay? So I just want to tell you, anger always, always has a cause. It always has a cause. It may be an underlying cause, but it always has a cause. It may be a past wound or a hurt or a shame or some kind of exposed vulnerability that got revealed. But anger always has a cause. And because anger is a response, because it has a cause, it means anger, in effect, is the second emotion. There's other things that might have happened that have triggered us into anger, but anger is the second thing, and it does get the best of us more often than we want to admit. In this series, here's what we're going to do. If only by degree, 
We're going to talk about how we get control of this second emotion and try to get control of it before we get controlled by it. And again, we're not going to master it. We're only going to be in this series for a couple of weeks. I can't, we're not going to solve all of everybody's anger issues throughout the whole world. We're just going to talk about this for a little bit. And if only by degree, we might be able to take control of some of the anger just a little bit instead of being controlled by it, then we'll call that progress. And to make the point, the point more definitively, one pastor says it this way about anger being the second emotion. I think this is really wise. Here's what he says. <clears throat> he says, look, this is a guy named Tim Keller. What makes you angry is not what has happened to you. What makes you angry is not what has happened to you. And some of you are like, there's a lot of stuff that's happened to me. I, no, 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 there's some things that made me angry. That's fair. His point further is this, though, which I think is really, really smart. And we'll talk about this throughout this whole series. What makes you angry is not what has happened to you, but what you tell yourself about what has happened to you. There's a thing that's happened, and then there's sometimes in an instant we make a story about what's the meaning or the significance about what has happened, and that's the thing we're actually responding to. In other words, anger needs a story. It needs a story that we tell ourselves. And the question we have to ask throughout this whole series is, what story are we telling ourselves? What story have we been telling ourselves? What story are we looking to tell ourselves? What story upon reflection, looking back, we go, and the re I, here's the reason why I can make that all make sense now and why I, get to, why I get to act that way. We need a story. Anger needs a story. What story are we telling ourselves? Sometimes we get the wrong story, or maybe we get a piece of it right just so we can justify our rage. We'll talk a little bit more about rage next week. At times we get the story right, and we just want to know how do we act appropriately? Like, hey, there's a reasonable kind of anger that's here, but how am I supposed to act appropriately? And depending on how you grew up, you might even believe there's not even ever an appropriate use or direction or power for anger that should never even be part of the conversation because of how you grew up with anger. What's the right use of it? In the Bible, the most internally referenced verse in the Bible, meaning the Bible quoting itself. So remember, probably a better description of the Bible rather than a book is a library. So here's the collection of this library of books. Which those, the, the one thing that the books quote more than anything else, there's one verse that those books quote more than anything else. And I'm going to show you that in a second. And if you were here last week, you heard Jim Burns do a, a talk on generational kind of wisdom. It was really great. It's worth listening um, for sure. Go back and listen to it. It was incredible. And he talked about this a little bit, and so I just want to come back to it again, but kind of put it in a little bit more context when it comes to what we're talking about now. Now, here's what's happening. It's in Exodus chapter 34. Moses uh, has, he's been leading the Israelites now for not that long, but he's been leading them for a little bit here. He doesn't know yet that it's going to be 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He just knows they're, they're you know, they're going to be wandering a little bit. They've, Moses, by God's power, has led God's people out of captivity in Egypt, and they're wandering around. And they, Moses has seen God do incredible things, and he goes, God, I want to see your glory. After all these things he's kind of seen, and God goes, ah, here's what we'll do. I'm going to pass by you a little bit, and I'm going to show you what I'm all about, but kind of in an obscured kind of way. It's kind of an interesting passage. In any event, what God says to him is, here's who I am. I'm going to pass by. Here's who I am. This is God on God. Meaning, here, if, if there's a description that you look for in the Bible, and you may not believe the Bible. I know some of you are not sure about that yet. It's okay. I just want to tell you. When you're looking in the Bible for what God says about his own nature, who he is, here's what he says. So you might, again, you're like, well, who, what's God all about? What's, what's the Bible say, God? Here you go. This is what the Bible quotes from itself more often than anything else. Exodus 34, verse 6. Here's what it says. God speaking about himself. The Lord, the Lord. The compassionate and gracious God. And then he says something, and I'm going to skip it for now. Just to show you to make the point, okay? I'm not going to skip it forever. Some of you are going to be like, I knew this church. They don't even believe the Bible. Just stay with me, okay? Check this out. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, abounding in love and faithfulness. Now, most of you, even if you're not sure about Jesus, not sure about the Bible, are like, that's great. I like that. That's all wonderful. Everything about that's good, and that's all true. God is compassionate, and he is abounding in love and faithfulness. And there's something between the two things which is so incredibly critical that makes us uncomfortable. A lot of us. And that's fair. But literally sandwiched between compassion and love is this attribute of God in his own self-description, that he is slow to anger. Now, some of you 
will be able to key on the slow part. Others of you are like, I can't get past the word anger. And this is a pretty difficult passage for a lot of reasons, and yet this is how God describes himself. I'll keep on going. We'll talk about it in a second. Here, look. Then he continues. Maintaining love to thousands. Most translations in your Bibles, most of the translations will have that translated as maintaining love to a thousand generations. Not just thousands, but thousand generations. And forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. And we're like, that's good. Let's stop talking right now. Wrap it up. Pray. Bring the band up. We're done. Woo! Way to go, God. You're awesome. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And we're like, oh, I've done some things. Why can't we stop the thing before? It was so great. And it gets even harder to hear. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Whoa, God, it's cool the jets here. We were, everything was great. We were, we were bounding in love and compassion and great and love. That was all great. Now we got some problems. And we have trouble with this. We have a really difficult time because for a lot of people, a lot of people will say, look, I'm, I'm, okay with the, I'm okay with God, but my God does not get angry. He's only got love. Only love, never anger. I don't want to tell you, it's an interesting kind of thing. I mean, I'm going to say a couple things here, and some of you, if you take them out of context, it's going to sound really bizarre. First is this, and I'm going to be really, really careful as I say this. That love and anger do have a connection, and it's really important to keep this in mind. Now, by the way, I want to make sure we're really clear about this. This is not a way to justify abuse by any stretch of the imagination. If people, if there's an abuse that's happening and someone's like, this is, I'm doing this because I love you, that's not true. It's not true. But there is a connection between love and anger. So hear me out. Human beings are complicated. I don't know if you knew that. Human beings are incredibly complicated because we are people who have been victims by other people of certain things. We've been victimized. Things have happened to us. People who had power or are supposed to love us or have responsibility over us have hurt us. People who are equal to us in so many other ways, our own peers have hurt us. We've been victimized. And we want to know as a person who's been hurt, is anybody going to take care of this? Or am I on my own? And God says to people who have been victimized, I'm on your side. But you don't need to take responsibility for vengeance. I've got that. Don't you go around wild westing on people and taking people out because something hurt you. That's not going to help. I've got this. You can let that go. I've got your back. But human beings who are also victims are also victimizers. We've done things and hurt other people. We've used our power or influence or authority to hurt other people. And we've used whatever we've got to sabotage people at times. We've not acted at our best when anger got the best of us. And God has to figure out with these com complicated human beings, what do I do with them? And the balance you get is abounding in love and compassion for people who have been the victimizers and for the victims I've got the anger to the third and fourth generation. I will protect you. I've got your back. Are you with me? There's an incredibly difficult tension that, that sort of gets described here about who God is. But there is a responsibility to anger for people who love those who they love. In other words, a couple examples. Uh, if you, if you had, suppose one day, maybe you were this kid when you were growing up. And maybe your parents were responsible. Maybe you are a parent. Maybe you're a parent of young kids. Maybe you're a grandparent of young kids. Maybe you babysit people who are like this. But you know there's a kid at some point, in every group, there's a kid who's a biter. <laughs> and a parent who says, we don't do biting anymore, that has to stop. That behavior is not okay because it's hurting other people. Now imagine a preschool teacher is like, hey, your kid's the biter. He's walking around just velociraptoring everybody. It's like, we can't have that. And if the parents said, oh, no, no, no. We only do love. We never do discipline or punishment. Okay, it was just Lord of the Flies at your house. People are just, it's, you can imagine what their house is like. There's a reasonableness to saying, that behavior is unacceptable, and I'm angry about the behavior, and I got to adjust it. I got to deal with that. To give you another sense about the word anger, let me just kind of give you a sense. 
Anger is action taken towards something. Okay, and I'm, this, is, this is my own like, definition of this, but so just bear with me. Anger is action taken toward whatever threatens whatever is loved. Anger is action taken, I think this is actually a paraphrase of what uh, Tim Keller said too, but action taken toward whatever threatens whatever is loved. Now, you might love something really valuable and wonderful, you might love something not so valuable and wonderful, but you might regard it as something valuable and wonderful, to make the point. I don't know much about, you know, animals and nature and everything else. It's great. Go out there, be in nature. It's awesome. I do know enough, and you know it too, that if you happen to come across a couple of little bears, baby bears, it's not wise to go over and try to pet them. I don't have to be a forest ranger to tell you that. Because you never want to get between a mama bear and her what? Cubs. Some of you who are moms, oh, you, you're like sweet and wonderful and you're kind of, everything's wonderful. Someone steps in between you and your cubs. You don't mess with them. You don't step between a mama bear and the cubs. When the mama bear perceives anything as a threat, she reacts with anger and intensity toward the thing that's a threat. Are you with me? This is God's love for the things he Love, this is the way God's responding, his anger towards those things. And I realize it's complicated, it doesn't answer everything. But God's anger is directed towards the threat of what he loves. In the Bible, what you get is that God's anger is moving at the greatest threat to all of human beings, to all of creation, which is death and chaos and captivity itself. And he moves with fierce anger towards those things that keep us captive or emulate death or create chaos. Which means there's an appropriate kind of anger, and we'll talk about that in week three of this series. But if you take the whole statement, just one more time, to read what's actually being said here, not separating anger and love and maybe combining them together, you get a fuller picture. And I know there's still a lot of questions around it, but here's what it says. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. God apparently is not in a hurry to be angry with us. And some of you may have grown up in a tradition where that's all you understood, that God's in a hurry to be angry at us. It doesn't appear to be the case. In fact, that quality of God's slow to anger is a critical piece of what the Bible will describe as how we ought to be as human beings. Proverbs 14 will say it this way. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Most of the translations will translate the word patience like this. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but one who has a hasty temper exalts, let's say lifts up, celebrates, honors, folly. Slow to anger. Anybody ever, just a moment of confession again, I know we're doing a lot of this hand-raising stuff, so, you know, bear with me. But anybody ever, after like a, an outburst of anger, ever thought to themselves, that was stupid? Just want to admit that? Yeah, okay, that's all that's saying. If we were just a little slower on kind of the outburst, maybe we could avoid some stupidity. James will say it this way. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, okay? Everyone. So what I'm going to show you next, you might not want it to be everyone, but it's everyone. Because you don't want to be included in it if you're like me. Everyone should do the following things. Be quick to listen. A little bit of a challenge. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Okay, maybe we got the order wrong there. Okay, but I'm not sure. Maybe it should be slow to listen. Okay, quick, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James is writing to a group of people, the early church community, trying to figure out how to be people who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And there's conflict, evidently. And he's like, whoa, 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 everybody. Not just some of you, everybody. Let's start being quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. But that's not how we want to read it. If you're like me, and I realize you're not, you're way more, you're, I mean, you have gotten more stuff figured out than I have. I get that. But here's how I want to read it. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone else should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. That's what I wanted to say. That's how most of my life gets, operates. Ask my kids. They'll tell you. That's how I operate. And it's probably the source of some of the most intense conflict in my life. I'm the one who gets to speak. You're the one who gets to listen. We live in a world like that. In fact, to sort of separate, just to really quickly make the point even further, in the world, we are constantly encouraged, in fact, we're threatened if we don't, 
to live as people who are slow to listen. Take your time listening. In fact, be quick to speak and be quick to anger. This is the world we live in. You and I know this. We live in it constantly. It is the new cycle we're exposed to constantly. It's the reason why we don't, know how to, we don't even know how to get out of some of this stuff because it's around us constantly. We don't know what to do with it, but we know the world says, hey, be slow to listen. Put listening on the back burner. Be quick to speak and quick to anger, and that's how you show who you really are. Go out there and do that stuff. But the Bible says be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Perhaps the most countercultural thing we may ever do is to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. We love speed. We love reaction times. I had an eye test uh, two weeks ago, and it was, and they were just, and I haven't had an eye test in a really long time, but they're like, okay, we're going to test your peripheral vision. Some of you are familiar with this. I didn't, I'd never had this test before. We're going to test your peripheral vision and just click the button when you, when you like cease like a wavy line or whatever. And I'm like, I got this. She's like, okay, why don't you dial down the intensity? I'm like, oh, you're about to see a record broken. And so I'm like <laughs> looking in this little thing and I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, like finishing. The th I'm like, I see it, you know, like trying to get, I put it down like, where's like the leaderboard? Because I mean, <laughs> I probably just won, you know? And she's like, you, you did great. You really, we could tell we did, you completed the test. I'm like, yeah, but how fast was I? It wasn't a test of your reaction time. <laughs> yeah, but if there was a test of my reaction time, how would I do? Oh, we love speed. We love things going at a pace. We have the pressure to give the right answers right now to be seen as the right person. And the question you and I have to ask is, is now necessarily the best time for my response? Or can it wait a second? Does it have to be right now? Because for me, I'm finding out in my life, as a general rule, the more in a hurry, or, the more in a hurry that I am, the more likely I am to be, be angry about the dumbest stuff. Like speed, pace, and my likelihood of responding in anger are directly proportional. Maybe if we took a second, that to take a second, it gives a chance for something other than anger to win the moment. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Slow to get angry. Quick, slow, slow. Now, anger needs a story, which means it has a cause. And we talked about this already. And then even, the truth is that anger has a story and it has a cause, even if we don't see the cause at all. And we'll talk more about this in detail. Hopefully we'll have time to do it next week. I think we will, but we'll talk about this more next week. But here's the truth. More often than not, the thing that we're reacting to in anger is not the thing we're reacting to. Some of you are like, it's a little Jedi. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. You ever been in a situation where you're having a conversation, it's escalating, it's getting more and more intense, and finally there's sort of a moment of clarity where one person in the party goes, what exactly are we talking about here? Is this really... You know, because it's like the cereal bowl got left out, and it seems like this is now like, whoa, this is really intense. Or, you know, someone has decided to put the toilet paper under, like the roll going underneath like a barbarian, instead of like a human being the way God intended over the top, and we all got to have it out right now, and it's like, are we reacting to the toilet paper? Or something else going on here? <laughs> Some of you have had fights about this, and you people who are, you're right. That's what God says. It's in the Bible somewhere. I don't remember where, but it's in there. It's from, you know. The thing we're reacting to is not the thing we're reacting to. Now, I'm going to show you a story, and it's not a direct one-to-one -one parallel here, but you're going to have to try, so you're going to have to stay with me a little bit. It just illustrates the point, okay? So it's not necessarily a person being overly angry, although you can assume some anger here, but I'm going to tell you the story. Jesus is teaching in big crowds, huge crowds, so big that people are getting trampled, and he's, you know, all these people are kind of coming around him, and then someone in the crowd, like, interrupts Jesus' teaching, which you've got to be pretty bold to be like, whoa, 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 hold up one second, Jesus. Uh, got a question. He just like interrupts him. And here's what he says. This is Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his, the inheritance with me. Like there's been an injustice. That's the presenting issue. You can imagine the anger that's attached to that. I, he, my brother, is a horrible person and he's cutting me out of something. I need us, I need you to respond. Go, you're kind of respected. Now imagine, whole crowd. Jesus is like, we're talking about this now? 
Jesus replied, man, who appointed me as a judge or an arbiter between you? Like, don't get me involved in your nonsense. And the guy's like, but it's a serious thing, and I'm anger. And here, that there's a huge issue, and then all of a sudden there's this conflict that's erupted here, and you can sense the anger. Again, it's not explicit there, just, you can imagine. This guy's holding out on me, and it's a big injustice. Then Jesus said to the whole crowd, like he's listening to this guy like, okay. And he looks at the whole crowd. Watch out to the whole crowd. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. Now, the guy is saying, here's the issue. I got, there's an injustice that needs to be solved. Jesus, defend this justice. And then Jesus is like, no, you got a greed issue. And then Jesus goes on and tells a story about a guy who had all this wealth and he had more and more wealth and didn't know what to do with it. He, put, he bought barns to put more and more stuff in his wealth. And then he died. And that was like, he wasted all of his, he kept all of his wealth for himself. And it just got, it went to waste. And then that guy, you can imagine in front of the crowd, standing there. So are you going to talk to my brother? Or <laughs> do, I, do I wait? Or what do I do? <laughs> just like, you can, do, I, do I sit down now? We, you know, what do we do? The issue that's being presented is there's an injustice, and what's actually being uncovered is greed. So when we're confronted with the idea of anger, we have to ask this question, what's this about? <laughs> what's this about? To say it more pointedly, what's this really, oops, what's this really about? Like we think it's about this, but I have a reaction and it feels pretty intense. What's this about? Now, that's it. What we're looking at in anger is our reaction to something. We've told ourselves a story. We're reacting to a thing. What is that story that we're telling? What's our reaction? And for us to take, again, we're not going to solve all of our anger issues. I don't ha I, that's not my expertise. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my own story in this and some of what the Bible says about this over the next couple of weeks. But the question I want you to start with is this one right here. If you're having trouble sort of identifying your own anger issues, what I perhaps might be, might be one of the most important questions to ask is, what am I defending? What is it that's, whatever, remember that something is a threat to what you love, what is it? What am I defending or protecting? Remember that the thing that sort of we defend the most is the thing that we love the most. In other words, the thing that we're defensive about the most is the thing that we love the most. And often what we'll say is, look, we're, pre I should say this way, we're predisposed to find a noble justification for our anger. You know the reason why I did it? Because of all these really noble reasons. And here's what I want to tell you. And this is from experience. It turns out not everything is a bear cub in need of a mama bear. Not everything in our lives is a bear cub in need of a mama bear. Sometimes we're defending stuff and protecting things that are beneath the surface, that, and our responses are way higher than they ought to be because we're defending something else that we love more than even the presenting issue. So maybe a more appropriate question might be this, what am I really defending here? It may be about someone not doing their chores or someone else not being responsible for their thing or it might be something else that's going on in our house or in our family or whatever else we said we were gonna do as a couple or as brothers or as friends or whatever, but really it's about something deeper and more often than not, the thing we're defending can be reflected in the thing we're most afraid of. And maybe we have to ask the second question, which is, what am I really afraid of? What am I afraid of? Because there's something behind this thing. There's a thing behind the thing. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Hopefully we get time to do this next week. But what am I really afraid of? I'll give you nine things. They're not a comprehensive list of all the things you could be afraid of. Here's the ones that might connect with some of you. And again, some more than others, but if you had to rank them, here's the thing that gets you the most scared. Being wrong. Feeling unloved. Feeling worth, I'm afraid of feeling worthless. I'm afraid of not belonging. I'm afraid of being seen as an incompetent person. Like, you're really an idiot. Ooh, that stinks. You don't belong here. You don't have any worth here. You're incorrect. 
Maybe you're afraid of chaos or maybe some kind of being deprived. Like when things, I, I just can't have things being out of control and I'm really terrified of things being out of control and I keep things in control. Maybe you're afraid of being de deprived. Maybe you're afraid of being controlled. Maybe part of your own story is one where people in power who are supposed to love you or take care of you controlled you and you have a fear of that. Maybe you're just afraid of being confronted. And maybe there's some part of our response, some part of our story that we're telling. If we feel these kinds of things, even if we're not conscious of them, oftentimes they push us to act in a way that we would never otherwise act at our best. But when we feel these things are threatened, or some, this is what we can feel these, this fear present, well, that's when we have a story, and it justifies our action and our anger. Now, when you're in a moment, I'm going to give you three things. When you come up with the, when you come into a situation where the anger is present, an anger episode, let's just say, I'm going to give you three kind of responses, three kind of questions to ask, three kind of ways to approach it. And the first one is a full-on varsity, amazing answer. And if you can, if you can, if you can ask this question, you should be writing books and having a conference. You again, you're you're amazing. The other two are a little closer to home for me, but I'll give you when I'm at my best and the temperature is rising, when things are getting a little, I can do this at my best. I usually don't, but at my best. And if you can do this, you're in great shape. When there's a moment, things are escalating, and you can do this in the moment, you can ask this question, what is happening to me? What am I responding to? If you have the kind of self-awareness in a moment of anger as it's rising to be able to do this, you're amazing. Very rarely do I have this ability. But somehow in this ability is, the, is, is embedded in it a potential to de-escalate a situation. What's happening to me? What am I really responding to? Is this really, am I really angry about the toilet paper, which is a reasonable thing? Or is there something else that's going on here that I need to be responding to that's happening within me? If you can do that, you're ahead of the game, and you're amazing. A little bit of self-awareness will go an incredibly long way. Here's where more of us will live, okay? More often than not. After the fact, what just happened? There's like an explosion happened and we're all like, whoa, 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 whoa. What just happened? And by the way, this is like JV. You're like, you're, you might be called up during the CIF playoffs because this is like you're doing a good job. If after the fact you can say, I was out of control, something happened, I, man, that was, that was bad, what happened? I can take an inventory of what just happened and I can say, Something went on, and I gotta take it seriously so it doesn't happen again. That's pretty darn good. The temptation for most of us, though, because we live at such an incredible pace, is I don't really wanna know what happened. Yeah, some stuff happened. It wasn't great. I screwed it up, but I'm just gonna keep on going. And if to dig it all up now, forget it. We got things to go, I got things to do, I got, I got meetings, I got people I gotta meet, and it was, it was, I didn't even like that thing. We're just done, we're gonna move on, we're gonna keep on things going. I don't even wanna know what happened. I'm too, I don't even, I don't wanna, it just doesn't matter anymore. I don't know how it happened, I don't wanna know what happened. But in that situation, all we're saying is, I don't care if anger has control over me. I don't care. So what? I got angry. Whatever. Move on. Get, get tough. We got things to do. The world's still spinning around, and we got, I mean, we got places to go. If you're a person who wants to take seriously the idea of getting more control over your anger, then you're going to have to sort of wrestle with, at some point, the idea of what might have happened. And we're going to work to identify some of the sources of that anger. Again, maybe more, next, more, more so next week. But there's one other thing I want you to think about. In the first category of these sort of responses, what's happening, this isn't, this isn't necessarily going to apply. But the second two categories, this applies, because this is where most of us live. This is where anger got the best of us. At some point, we're reflecting upon it, or we're not reflecting upon it. But when anger gets the best of us, there's a response we need to have, and it's a three-word response. And it is not to excuse the action that ever happened against you at all, but you're something that you and I need to be comfortable, get more comfortable doing. And I'm not comfortable with it, but it is three words that you and I need. And they will go a long way in every single one of your relationships. It's these words. I was wrong. The earliest memory, I have, well, not the earliest memory, but um, because I was wrong is basically saying, I'm going to hold myself accountable for what I did. 
It's the first step of holding myself accountable. I remember when I was, um, my, my youngest son, who's now 14, I remember when he was three years old, I remember this like clear as day. I don't remember the incident, I just remember the response. I, I overreacted. I don't remember what it was, but I remember I sat him down on the couch. And if, I mean, you can just, I can picture his three-year-old body. <laughs> and I, I did some damage. I don't remember what it was. But I looked at him and I was like, hey, in the simplest terms like, that he could understand, I'm sorry. I was wrong. It's not getting through. I'm like, okay. I'm sorry. I was wrong. He looks at me. Three years old. Doesn't take much to intimidate a three-year-old. Third time. I'm sorry. I was wrong. And then he hugged me. Anger got the best of me. And in a moment that a three-year-old could understand, this principle was born in my life. And it was one of the hardest moments in my life. And it is still to this day my ability, I know that for me, as the person who is acknowledging that I lost control for a moment, saying it three times seems to drive it home. It might take you six times. It might take you only one, but it took me three. And this principle of the idea of taking, holding ourselves accountable for what we've done, it's actually the way that relationships are reforged in some way to go, look, I know I screwed it up. Is there a pathway forward? And it's the same thing. God looks at us. God, I know I screwed up. I was wrong. And God moves towards us. When we're not at our best, at our worst, God moves towards us. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what it is to get a little bit more control over this second emotion. But let's pray together as we respond. Jesus, there's plenty of areas in our lives where we were wrong. And while we don't like to dwell on them, we're grateful that you do deal with those things. That you put those to death on the cross. And so, Father, now we get a chance to respond setting grateful hearts to music. Just in the stillness, and maybe even as we're responding in the song, is there someone in your life who needs to hear you say, I was wrong? And maybe it will take three times. And it's hard because maybe you were owed and I was wrong from them too. And you can't control their reaction. And saying you were wrong doesn't excuse what they did. It doesn't give them permission. But we come before God and we say, we were wrong. And we need you. And God restores and lifts up and breaks that chain of guilt and shame upon us. Because he's slow to anger. And he's rich in love and abounding in compassion. Jesus, hear us now as we respond to you. In your name, amen.
of you, it's a revelation that the idea that God is not in a hurry to be angry with you. That God is intent on breaking whatever it is that's holding you and I captive. His intention is to bring freedom and hope. And some of you are trapped in some stuff, and maybe anger is getting the best of you. But God is rich in love and abounding in compassion. 
maybe you're a person who just needs a little bit of prayer today. That you, you don't even have the words, but you just want to walk up to someone on either side of me or up, up on the sides close to the stage. And you're just like, look, I don't even know what to pray, but I'm just losing a little bit of control. And could you just pray for me? People would love to pray with you for that, for whatever it might be. But as we conclude, would you hold out your hands and would you just receive these words as a prayer, a blessing? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you guys next week. tried so hard to see it, took me so long to believe it, that you choose someone like me to carry your victory, perfection could never earn it, can't give what we don't Take the bro.
to prove there's nothing left to prove he freely gave it to us